Hello, everyone. Welcome to this presentation at the Diana Initiative. My name is Tina Shakur, and I'm very excited about this session. We have Maggie McAlpine joining us. She is an election security specialist at Nordic Innovation Labs and co-founder of the DEF CON Voting Village. This should be a really timely and interesting talk for all of us. Um, she is going to do something special for everyone at the end of this session because this is only a 30 minute talk. She's going to open a session in the left hand side. You'll see it on your screen sessions and she'll do live Q&A there after the talk. So bring your questions and she'll be ready to answer. This is pre recorded. So please remember to hard refresh the screen when you see it begin. And again, I want to thank all of our diamond sponsors for making sure that the Diana initiative put on an awesome show for everyone this year. So with that, let's go ahead and see what Maggie has to say on election security. Hello, Diana initiative. My name is Maggie McAlpine and I'm an election security specialist with Nordic innovation labs. Uh, and one of the organizers of the DEF CON Voting Machine Hacking Village. Uh, I'd like to give you a brief overview today of the challenges facing the US election system in 2020, and boy, are there many. Um, so here you'll see my biography to answer the basic, who am I, don't bother reading it, it's in your thing. Um, here's a better picture of me, a little bit more recent than the one I've been spreading around. So basically I've been in election security for about 10 years now. Um, got into it back in 2010 with a little company called Clear Ballot Group. Uh, I was with them a little over a year when I became uh, basically an auditing specialist um, as their operations manager. Uh, after that, went on to do a few more uh, cybersecurity startups, but stayed in the election security uh, world and uh, did some pro bono work in the meantime, for example, for California and Colorado, uh, which is listed in there. I've worked with numerous states uh, to advise them on uh, their security offerings uh, for, for uh, elections. And um, most famously recently, uh, as I mentioned, became one of the organizers for the DEF CON Voting Machine Hacking Village, which uh, just took place remotely uh, last week. So I guess the next question would be, uh, why am I doing this? Uh, besides just speaking with you today, because I enjoy it. Um, one of the things that people will often ask is kind of, you know, how did you get into election security? It's a little bit esoteric. Up until recently, it was not a very um, well-known or even well, you know, people didn't even know it existed really as a concern. Uh, I certainly met my fair share of glazed looks, but I truly um, am passionate about this field. And uh, one of the, um, how do I say this? One of the reasons is uh, because I, it's a great confluence of being civically involved while also, you know, using my uh, cybersecurity expertise. But I actually prefer when people ask, why do you care about election security to quote a movie which has a animated raccoon in it? What has the galaxy ever done for you? Why would you want to save it? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it. So as I mentioned, there's a, a, a little breakdown of my bio leading up to uh, the DEF CON village again, no need to read it. But basically, um, I truly believe that all activist measures, all anything that's policy based uh, really has voting at its center of, of, as a linchpin. Uh, basically, if elections can no longer be trusted to be democratic uh, and to represent the will of the people, a lot of other good things we can try to do in the world kind of go out the window because now you're at the mercy of uh, maybe another nation state, which may not have the best, uh, your best interest at heart, maybe someone domestically who doesn't have your best interest at heart. And as I'm going to mention later, if we don't solve some of these problems, any random script kitty who doesn't have your interests at heart. Um, so one of the things that happens when we're talking about election security is it's very easy, and I do this all the time, to just kind of go off on a bazillion different tangents because elections are extremely complex. Um, technically, they kind of begin, if you want to talk about the, you know, where does an election begin and where does it end, you could kind of say it begins with the founding of democracy uh, and a government. I, I really like that one. I was an archaeologist in a past life, and that's a Ostracos or a ballot for uh, Pericles of Athens uh, that we still have today. Really cool. Uh, but really what we have, and I have to thank uh, the CISO, the Buddha Judge campaign who was on a, a camp, uh, on a talk with recently because he put this very nicely, which is a three bucket problem. 
which is that you have campaigns, influence operations, and election infrastructure. And I know from personal experience that it's really easy to start talking about one of these and then just sort of go off in a million different tangents. But those are actually three pretty distinct silos of how we talk about election security. So while campaigns and protecting uh, campaign um, campaigns from uh, overseas influence or attack is an incredibly key thing, and while influence operations is an enormous problem, which I wouldn't even which is we're going to mention a couple of times, but is just so out of my wheelhouse that I can only stand in awe of those who have to deal with it every day. We're going to actually focus on the center one there, the election infrastructure question. Uh, that's kind of my bread and butter. It's what I feel best um, you know, capable of talking to you guys about. But I can kind of answer questions about the other ones if they come up in the Q&A session, uh, which is going to be a little spinoff at the end after this. So um, as I was saying, elections, very complicated, kind of begin with when the campaign or issue is put out there uh, to be voted on. And they sort of end way, way, way later with the peaceful transition of power from the loser. Anybody can say, I was the winner of the race. Give me, give me power. Losers are the ones who have to accept that Democrat, uh, that the democratic process worked out uh, and that they and their followers need to step peacefully aside. And that is the real promise of a uh, of a democratic society. Um, so in between all that, you've got so much. We're going to barely scratch any of the surface of this, but everything from uh, voter registration, voter back end, voter, you know, election management, sign up times, lines, voting machines. Uh, who's allowed to vote? Are they voting legally? We will touch on that. Uh, you know, how do we deliver the ballot? Can we get it there in time? Uh, how is it counted? How do we make sure that the counting was done properly? Uh, how do we certify the results? How do we report the results? How do we make sure that people don't uh, read false information about the results? All of that, any single one of those things could be hacked and it would technically be election hacking. Um, but it's probably not what first pops into people's minds because what usually pops into people's minds when we talk about election hacking is the uh, election machine tabulation hack. But tabulation is really only a very small part of the process. So um, one of the things I like to also bring up, and this is kind of um, kind of get you all in the right headspace. So one of the fun challenges that we face in election security is um, if you're building a threat model, which I'm sure many of you have done, one thing you might do potentially uh, is think about who would potentially want to attack your target. And the very fun thing about US elections is the answer is, well, everyone, foreign government official, domestic, foreign political operatives or domestic ones, foreign activists or domestic ones, Foreign criminals, domestic criminals, and if we don't see, address these vulnerabilities, foreign and domestic script kitties are also on the table. So basically every single person on earth has a motive to uh, impact the US elections, would stand to have something to gain. And right now we are, I, I don't wanna disparage any colleagues here, but let's just say that until quite recently, uh, election security in the US was treated with about the same level of technological sophistication as the county fair. Uh, so we are trying to address that um, and uh, the problems are huge and numerous and extremely slow moving. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, we uh, why we can't just address all of this quickly overnight, we have 54 sets of election laws individually in the U.S. because the states run their own elections uh, and the territories. So that's if a state is the one who's the only one responsible for running their elections. Sometimes it's down to the county level. Sometimes it's down, which is, uh, by the way, 3,000 counties. And then sometimes it goes below that. So it could be over to the township level, which could be over 5,000 individual locations, which each have their own machinery, their own way of doing things, their own administration. And we have the largest number of ballot options anywhere. So I just want to quickly say, if what's percolating in your mind right now is, why don't we just pass a law and fix it? Or um, why don't we just do what this other country does? It's really not in the cards because of how massively complicated by design American elections are. Um, one thing I would also quickly point out, because again, pass a law, just have DHS step in. Um, the federal government has actually no control over US elections by design. Uh, they are fragmented. Uh, they are a strict state's right. And this, unless you should think, oh, well, we'll just ask the states very nicely to hand over their cybersecurity management to the federal government. Obviously, they'd want to do that. Um, no, not even slightly. They vociferously guard uh, this right to manage their own elections. And we're seeing a little of that conflict 
uh, right now. So whatever the federal government says, all they have power to do is offer money um, or support or advice, uh, which the states can and often do turn down. So uh, before we get too bogged down here, uh, so quick, quick, quick history lesson. Um, it all kind of goes back to the Florida 2000 election. That's when the cybersecurity community began to kind of take a look at election security issues in the United States. Um, in that uh, it's kind of the origin of, well, it's certainly when a lot of people, myself included, watched it on AOL and what first went, oh my God, what if, what's wrong with our elections? Um, this led to something called the Help America Vote Act. Uh, and this was billions of dollars put into the election, uh, US elections to basically shore up and modernize. Unfortunately, no cybersecurity uh, was, well, frankly, cybersecurity was a sci-fi concept at the time, but no um, limitations were put into how the states could run their own election. There was no strings attached. And this led to a thing many people have heard about, uh, which is the uh, DREs, which is the touchscreen machines, which are so, um, you know, that election security people love to hate. They leave no trace. They have no receipt. Somebody could just go in there, uh, change the numbers around, and there would be absolutely no way to trace it. Why not look at the logs? Well, these things don't often keep logs. There's just myriad problems with these things. It almost makes you miss the hanging chad. Um, so the wide adoption of DRE machines led to growing alarm in the cybersecurity community in the mid, mid aughts, um, which eventually led to some a couple of really great studies, including the Everest Report and the Ohio Top to Bottom Review. I'm happy to give a link to these uh, afterwards in the Q&A. Uh, and this has uh, led to you know the whole cybersecurity community, election cybersecurity community in general, which eventually leads to uh, 15 years later, the DEF CON voting machine hacking village, where we got to get into the guts of things after the DMCA limitations, uh, which had previously prevented good faith hacking efforts, except under extremely uh, uh, difficult circumstances, uh, which is a tale for another day. We discovered that zero of these vulnerabilities have been patched. Uh, so this is normally where my talks would be kind of focused on. We could spend a whole hour just talking about um, the relationship between vendors and election security in the United States and all of these problems. Um, but we also have, and, and, and then we would you know, talk about the solutions, right? In a normal year, then we'd talk about the solutions. Uh, we'd talk about paper ballots, a return to paper ballots, which is basically a secure, anonymous way to record the voter's intent. We can look at it afterwards. Um, things have been improving in this space. I think we were at one point at 13 states that had DRE or mixed DRE um, mixed in with their paper ballot optical scan. Now we're down to like eight. Um, so great progress there. Lots of reasons to be optimistic. The other thing that we've been pushing for is a thing called risk limiting audits. It's a statistical audit. You can see the flow chart there uh, where statistical magic basically allows us to uh, choose random ballots and certify that the election uh, went as it was supposed to. Basically the voting machine did its job correctly. Um, and uh, what we wanted with this, it was the quickest, cheapest, it was made by a great guy called Philip Stark. It's the quickest, cheapest way uh, that we can implement if we're lucky, maybe by 2025, we'll have it in place where uh, every single race uh, goes through this risk limiting audit. So there's no threshold, there's no, you didn't get 4% or 5%, you know, uh, so you're not allowed to ask for this. Um, because of course, you know, the inherent risk there would be, uh, oh, uh, if it's under, and this is true, by the way, if if, if the person wins by over 1%, for example, um, they then we're not going to have a recount. There's nothing suspicious. Well, if I'm a criminal, right, then I'll just make sure I win by 2% if I have that level of control. So um, risk limiting audits are to raise the floor of security on paper and, and can only be done with paper ballots. Um, and basically allow us to, before the authentication period, uh, before the certification period is over, to certify that the election um, was, uh, chose the right winner, that the, the, um, the, the machine acted correctly and everything went well. So we were really pushing for these. Uh, a lot of states are moving forward, like Colorado, Rhode Island with these. It's uh, really great. The, Colorado especially has been fantastic. Um, so this is, again, normally what my talk would kind of uh, be very focused on is explaining risk limiting audits, paper ballots, things like that. Um, but then, of course, there's new problems. There's always new problems, right? Lately, it's been ballot marking devices. Now, if you are a denizen of the nerdier parts of the election security Twitter stream, you may know that there's been a great deal of fighting over ballot marking devices, uh, which is basically we had just managed to start push, making this push for paper ballots. And then the vendors came out with a new problem for us, which is computer marked ballots, uh, which uh, a University of Michigan study discovered uh, may just bring us right back to square one because people don't actually check their ballot after it's been printed by this machine. 
So uh, that basically means now you can just attack the way that the machine fills out its little paper ballot. It gets dropped into the box. The voter doesn't check it. It could also be falsified and now risk limiting audit will no longer save you because you can't go to a accurate record of the voter's intent. So this has become a huge flashpoint. And you may have seen things like paper ballots now or hand counted paper ballots now or more to the point, um, hand marked paper ballots. Um, so I'm going to quickly say, no, you don't want hand counted paper ballots. Our elections are too huge, too complex. Humans lie and are very bad at counting. So let's just quickly say, no, please no hand counted paper ballots, but also hand marked paper ballots. Uh, so some election experts, I'm going to quickly explain the drama here. Some election security experts kind of got in trouble with the activist community because they weren't, um, saying loud enough and simply enough, handmarked paper ballots for everything. And the reason we don't do that is because disabilities are still a thing. The reason that ballot marking devices were justified was A, people are bad at filling out their ballots and the vendors were hoping to capitalize on this concern. But B, people with disabilities exist and they also need to vote. And if you have motor control issues or vision issues, uh, you can't just do a handmarked paper ballot necessarily in your home. And this is um, its own concern and one that election security experts are very worried about. So we are always, what we're trying to do is have the, um, we're not trying to say no ballot marking devices ever. And this is kind of where the uh, flashpoint was. We're just saying that we would like to keep ballot marking devices in this sort of assistive technology to uh, to the people who need it and keep hand marked paper ballots to those uh, to whom that is an option. Uh, and hopefully uh, that, and therefore keep the, um, the the ballot marking devices, this extra level of technology, which could have inherent risks um, siloed and protected and given uh, the scrutiny it deserves to keep it safe. Because if you give it to everybody, we have even more problems than we had before. And we have so, so many problems. Like we have a lot of newer problems. For example, you may have heard of it, COVID-19. So all this stuff that I would normally be talking about right out the window, we have new problems. And so, so many new problems this year. Uh, for example, how are we gonna protect our poll workers like me this fall? Uh, also, how are we gonna protect our voters? As you may have seen from this tragic case in Wisconsin, uh, when voters uh, were standing in line for hours at the height of the pandemic, well, who knows what the height of the pandemic is anymore, but um, these are major concerns which have just thrown a wrench into everything. Um, the good side, I guess, if you could say it, is that there will be more paper ballots that we can go back to. So, hey, less of that DRE concern a little bit. The bad side, everything else. So what is the newest problems? Now, originally when I proposed this talk, I do apologize. I was going to go over the findings in the DEF CON village. This was back in February when I proposed this. Um, you know what? If you want the link to the DEF CON reports, if you can't find them on your own, we can discuss them later. I'll get them to you. You can read them on your own. But really, we have much bigger, newer problems. This slide is one that I was even hesitant to fill in because as of today, which is about a week before the Diana con uh, conference when I'm uh, you know, recording this, uh, we have a new just as you know, new thing happening every day. So by the time you see this, it might already be out of date. So uh, we have things like chaos at the US Postal Service. We have the chronic lack of funding. And yes, it is way too late for long-term planning in this regard. That was spring when we needed this money for to implement widespread mail-in voting. It is now fall. Money would still be great, but the long-term planning we wanted to do, that's in the past. Uh, poll worker shortages. Most poll workers are over the age of 65. Uh, as you may know, those people are the most at risk for COVID and are reasonably speaking, protecting themselves. So we really, really need young people, people who are less at risk to step up or those long lines that may have infuriated you in the news recently will just get longer because there aren't, it's not necessarily malicious. Sometimes there just aren't enough people to staff all of the polling places. And that's why we need poll workers. We need volunteers more desperately than ever. We've also got things like foreign influence campaigns. Those never went away. In fact, we've done very little to address them since 2016. Uh, and those are going to be a huge concern. Uh, we also have domestic in misinformation campaigns uh, from the top down. We've got people giving misinformation about voting, which is another huge concern that election security experts are having to deal with on a daily basis now. And just so, so much more. In fact, there might be a new thing by the time you see this. We are very exhausted. Uh, there are some preventable new problems. I'll try to be quick about this. Internet voting, sometimes brought up as a solution. It is not a solution. We do not want it for a lot of reasons. It's not the same thing as online banking. 
Uh, there was a great quote from Ron Rivest where, and, and Matt Blaze where they basically said, it's like somebody saying we put a man on the moon, so why can't we put a man on the sun? And then insisting that if you don't put a man on the sun, that you're just not trying hard enough uh, and that you just need to understand why we so badly need a man to land on the sun. The thing is the technology does not exist to be both authenticatable and anonymous. And the anonymous ballot, the secret ballot, is a key part of elections. Now, maybe some people feel very secure in where they are, but there's plenty of reasons why. You might not want your in-laws or your boss or your future boss or a big tech corporation or the government to have a record of how you personally voted uh, that they could trace back to you. So they, because we could have voting, uh, by the way, we could have internet voting tomorrow if you were okay with just online banking style of, oh, yes, hi, it looks like my vote was misrecorded. Uh, let's, um, oh, yes, sir, let's go and fix this. Um, it says you were voted purple party, but I see you wanted orange party. Let me fix that right now. Now, that if we had that, we could do that right away. But the thing is, there's plenty of reasons, which I just re listed, that we don't want to do that. Now, Again, lest people should say uh, you just don't want it hard enough. If you figure out this solution, you have created a truly anonymous online currency because you'll be able to give somebody a dollar and walk away and it can't be traced back to you. That person is going to be a billionaire. So no, it's not a matter of just not incentivizing things enough. It's just not possible, uh, at least not for decades. And whoever comes up with it, they're going to be very rich. Uh, there are a couple things that are not actually problems. I'm going to wrap this up. Hopefully they'll give me an extra two minutes. Uh, since I'm moving the Q&A elsewhere, but not actually problems, voter fraud. It is a common partisan talking point. There is little evidence to support it in any statistically relevant numbers. Um, the, even the most vociferously partisan studies, which have been searching for it, have only been able to find very small numbers. Uh, the uh, Loyola Law School did uh, study 1 billion votes cast between 2000 and 2014. They found 31 credible cases. That's it. A five-year study on voter fraud by the George Bush administration found 86 after a five-year multi-million dollar study. And in both of those instances, the vast majority were just um, people, felons, who didn't know they weren't allowed to vote in that state. Um, and, and by the way, it varies from state to state. So that is an easy problem to have. There is no evidence of widespread or organized voter fraud. It is a myth. And it is a myth used maliciously for voter suppression. The other thing is mail-in voting. Not really a problem. We've been doing it for over 100 years. Um, I don't want to say, because I don't want people to, you know, my own community to jump down my throat, that it has no security risk. But I'll say they're very old security risks. They're ones that we're very familiar with. This isn't ones and zeros being flipped in a machine where we need a forensic cybersecurity expert to come in and see if a machine has been tampered with. This is things like people taking ballots out of your post box. Uh, this is things like coercion, where like an abusive household member uh, forces the other people in the household or the nursing home or some location to vote in a certain way. Um, these are things like... Um, uh, um, uh, I had a list here, but I can't find it right now. But anyway, th these are all problems where if you call up a cop and say, hey, somebody just raided my post box, uh, you know, that you don't have any problem explaining it to them. It's all very clear and straightforward. So it's not like there is no risk associated with mail-in voting, but it's extremely localized. It's extremely clear. It's a problem that we have been dealing with for over 100 years. Uh, so it really is uh, a very... I have to assume bad faith effort right now to cast aspersions on mail-in voting. And by the way, mail-in voting, absentee voting, they're functionally the exact same thing. Um, what to expect in 2020 uh, while I have one more minute of your time. Please don't freak out. Results may not be immediate. Uh, actually, they may take weeks because some uh, states don't have it that the ballot has to arrive by election day. They have it so that it has to arrive, it has to be postmarked by election day, which could mean at the current rate, uh, one or two weeks before all the votes can be certified and counted. This has already happened in California and New York primaries. It could be a while. And this time period is going to be extremely rife, uh, fertile ground for uh, conspiracy theories. So uh, lawsuits could uh, slow things further. Really nobody right now is, I mean, nobody right now is looking forward to what could happen on November, the night of November 3rd. Um, so please don't panic, stick to trusted news sources, avoid social media hysteria and, uh, and be ready to be patient. And what can you do personally as an individual vote? You should not take anything I'm saying as a reason not to vote. You should vote harder if you can, because large margins make it easier to detect fraud. People voting uh, make it easier to detect if something has gone wrong. 
Furthermore, th those misinformation campaigns, those PSYOP campaigns I've been talking about are spending millions of dollars, foreign and domestically, to dissuade people from voting every year, especially young people. If you disenfranchise yourself, you are saving those people money. And why on earth would you save the bad guys money? Make them spend every dime. So go vote. Don't disenfranchise yourself. Don't do the bad guys work for them. And if you can, please uh, sign up to be a poll worker. We desperately, desperately need them right now. You'll generally make about $200 for the day and you meet your members of your community. It's really nice uh, most years. Uh, also, again, check your news sources. Don't spread misinformation. If you are a company and you're thinking, wow, I really want to get in on this election cybersecurity thing. It seems to be going gangbusters right now. Uh, talk to an expert, please. There's a lot of ways to look like an idiot in this field. Uh, yes, elections are massively complex, massively um, complicated things. Uh, and if you really want to get down into the soup and nut, into the uh, into the nuts and bolts of uh, how elections work in the U.S., you can hire my firm. Uh, that's my one shameless plug. Thank you for uh, listening. Use my contact information and the cat tax. Have a great day. That was fantastic. I don't know about uh, all of you, but I'm slightly paranoid now, even more than I was. Um, just a quick couple of uh, logistic reminders. Maggie is over in the sessions area, going to take live Q&A for all of you. I'm sure based on the feed and the stage, there is plenty of uh, questions and dialogue there for her. And don't forget, today's keynote is going to be on a 30-minute delay so that we all have time to regroup and get there and, and enjoy that fully. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Good afternoon.